Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. <coughs> My name is Jay Ponteri, and I am the chair of Low Residency Creative Writing here at PNCA. And I would like to acknowledge the land that we're on. We acknowledge that the land we're located rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Clath Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalapulia, Malala, Bands of the Chinook, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. We also acknowledge the systemic policies of genocide, dislocation, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many indigenous native families today. As settlers and guests on these unceded lands, we respect the work of native nations and first peoples, leaders and families, and make ongoing efforts to center indigenous knowledge, creativity, resilience, and resistance. We acknowledge that this acknowledgement is not enough and is worthy of critique and reflection and is one of many steps leading towards the more active, essential task of the rematriation of native lands. Um, well, I am so excited that Vicky now is here, you all. This is so great. Okay, um, but before we get to V, um, I wanted to let you all know that the Halley Ford School of Graduate Studies, our final uh, lecture of this year, is on April 26th at 6.30 p.m., and it is Ronnie Quevedo. And I hope you all will, will come, will join us for that. Um, and um, I, before I hand over the official introduction to Kia, I just want to um, just tell you how grateful I am to work with you um, and that you're here and that you're with us. So thank you, V. Um, so um, our official introducer is the Halliford School of Graduate Studies Writing Fellow, Kia Rogers. All right, I am happy to welcome V. Key now. So V. Key now is the author of seven poetry collections and the uh, yeah, sorry, and of the short stories collection, A Brief Alphabet of Torture, winner of the 2016 FC2 Ronald Shulkinick Innovation Fiction Prize, the novel Swimming with the Dead Stars. Her poetry collection, The Old Philosopher, won the Night Boat Book Prize for Poetry in 2014. A recipient of the 2002, I'm sorry, 2022 Jim Duggan's PhD Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Prize. Her work includes poetry, fiction, film, and cross-genre collaboration. She was the fall 2019 fellow at the Black Mountain Institute. You can find out about more about V at vkinow.com. Great, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. H how are you? Good. Um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Jay, for um, all the wonderful uh, hospitality and kindness you bestow, my partner and I, during our trip here. And, um, and thank you, everyone, for making um, my experience here so uh, wonderful. I'm going to um, uh, read a lot of poems and maybe a short story. Um, I might not be able to make, I might not be able to read through that short story because it's pretty long. <laughs> so, um, but um, I'll try my best. Um, 
I'm gonna open with um, um, how about I open with Umbilical Hospital. Uh, the artist um, who did the work for this is actually she lives in Portland, so it seems fitting um, to read. And the artist's name is um, Heidi Davis. Um, So from my umbilical hospital, make your known, make your unknown known by walking away. Make your unknown known by walking away. Two moons sit side by side like owl's eyes, not glancing, not looking, not blinking, just staring. Courage and wisdom, these are essential wheat daily bread of air and time. You advise the moon owl, if you stare enough, a pastoral field will unite a lake like marriage, made inside a concubine's hairdo. Um, I read that because I, I, um, I was thinking of Eggard, of the owl <laughs> today, so I thought it seems fitting. Um, then I'm going to read a poem f from Human Tetris, which is a collaboration that I did with my best friend, Ali Ras. Uh, we wrote this manuscript over 30 days. Um, we were supposed to submit um, a poem uh, before midnight. So before, um, before the pumpkins return to their... Um, I guess the carriage return back into a pumpkin, um, we had to submit a poem to each other. And so this was done in 30 days, and then the m following month after that, it was accepted for publication. Um, and it's just uh, uh, my best friend wanted me to write a lot of personals, and I didn't want to, but I said I would do it as a poetic form. So I did it, but um, so... This one is um, a personal that has the following title. Your appetizer for my dessert. I live on ice and I don't believe in love at first sight. I also don't believe in unicorns or disruptive ruptures or futures. I'm just a Persian, semi-divergent, semi-daydreaming cat who won't just meow for milk or silk. I will certainly meow for sea debris and post-patriarchal carpooling of hands and tongues. That's if, if you are in the right lane. If your cunt is an extrovert and your heart an introvert, you are the perfect nylon heartbeat for me. At kissing on first dates isn't overrated. This person is in Iceland. Makes sense. Okay, um, and then I'm going to read from my poetry collection, which won't come out until August. So you get to see a preview of my collection called War is Not My Mother. It's, um, it's, it's a very big poetry collection. It has uh, over 160 pages, maybe. So it's a... Uh, it's a lot packed in there. Um, but uh, I'll read a poem called Soak the Government in Ashes. After one communist term, the cloud bursts become so authoritative in their dragon of hair in transparency. A Confucius tree walks to its first sight of a boreal gunfire from the north. Ka Sei Hung Lang soaks silhouettes with her nine-layer voice. At midnight, the clay sets out to unbundle its 500-year-old mud. War sobs bind the soul to one ministry, wailing for the battlefield of bribery. To become a public servant tomorrow, tuberculosis had to return to Moscow. Albates re revisit colonialism. The monsoon remained out of tune. 
how high up there is the yellow star of socialism. Two, a shoulder weeps next to his wife, his mind hidden inside a blade, the serpent way to combat infertility. Each word is an infantry man, marking the hoop prints of a thousand stones. The tree seeks death in one yellow rose petal. Our sabbatical days memorize war music. The plant collecting wind with its herbaceous shirt. Harmony waters its own eardrum, while the wet grass grows weary from oblivion and fading. Two raincoats ambulate in the rain. Moisture is not a man dressed in cloth. Serenity has no servants without masters. War doesn't have to wait for her to fall asleep on a stone. A postcard revisit a battlefield. Ding bing fu. Ding bing fu. The monsoons have a way of listening to the French rap songs of mortars and arteries, artilleries for one month, three we weeks, three days, without having to forcefully subdue fireworks on their way to being wet suit. In Vietnamese, ding means electricity, and phu is a sexy, a sexy military word for shield. And do you really need a literal translation or dossier for the middle name of one battlefield? Three. Dai Lung splits the throat of tradition with her octave mourning. Lamenting is a revolutionary word for enemy. To unfriend the refrain of sorrow, one must break the ribcage of a city, watch its struggle to breathe, its combat tents bruised like a pair of collapsed lungs. If he can't breathe, he won't sing. The injured soldier of a city must clutch his heart like a grenade. Above the mountains, above the mountains have found a way to live with independence and war crimes. Ho Chi Minh sleeps in his grave with one eye open, one eye closed. Fist sauce is a kind of pelagic sodium, not fermented by the smoke of war. Sleeping in clear cylinder glasses, pretending to be malted beer. When torn from water, what fish doesn't conform? Okay, and then I'm going to read from um, The Old Philosopher. I wonder if this poem is long. Oh, it's not. <laughs> okay. I don't like long poems. <laughs> I just read that one last one and I just ran out of breath. Okay. One rib removed. Makes sense. <laughs> I feel like one of my ribs got removed reading that last one. Okay. One rib removed. Almost this fallen biblical step almost removed me from the timeline of grasping this falling step, almost a remorse drawn into impulse, traps my cranium in bones and flesh. My memory inspired by the, pain, the panting imbued by sound of the importance of ritual, of the habit deleting that missing note from the lungs, cripples my t breath timekeeper, take a metomic note. This is this at that time, I, my ribs are piano keys. The piano grasps for my body falling, but later when a key, a rib is removed from me, my breath skips a note. My breath skips a breath. My breath skips a step on the stairs of breathing. Whisper, murmur, collapse. Annihilate the odor of naming, altering the chronometer garden inside my cranium, the human male. Okay. Um, this is a short story collection. 
And I won't be reading from it because I just want to tell you how pretty this cover is. Um, it's one of probably one of the sexiest cover that all of my of all my books. This is the sexiest. And, um, and the reason I'm telling you about it is because um, the artist uh, Tiffany Lynn made this um, a, did, did this crayon piece um, in Vegas, and she showed it to me and. Um, she doesn't have a show on it, so it's not available. And the only way you can get the sexy art pieces is to buy my book. So that's why I'm telling you about it. Okay. Um, I'm going to read from my um, collection of poetry called Fist Carcass. Oh, I chose a long one. Um, I'm going to find you a really short one. Um see okay. This one is short. Um my face. When he rode me on his motorcycle, the wind shook my face like a glass of water. When I climbed down from the bike, my face spilled all over me. I wrote I wrote this poem actually. Um, after a police officer who is like six, six foot eight. Is it six feet eight or six foot eight? Um, anyway, he was really tall and he came knocking at my door and asked me on a date. And I didn't know how to say no, so I said yes. Um, um, and um, so I wrote that poem because I didn't want to go on a date. Um, but it's short, and I think my narration of it is long. Um, OK, here's another short one. This one is a, has a very sexy poem. A bell curve is a pregnant straight line in it. It is so sexy that I'm not going to read it to you. Um, it's 10 pages long, so you can, if you want that sexiness, you're going to have to read it yourself. Um, um, because even though I wasn't um, I wasn't extracted from Adam's rib, I feel like I've lost a lot of ribs <laughs> uh, in the process. OK, so here's a short one. Not sexy at all, but that will do. Um, the afternoon on impulse. Just before morning closes her deformed smile, your hands dismiss respiratory foams. Razor on the edge, your face couldn't resonate with me, so let us be foes in the aftersave. Um, I wrote that poem because I thought maybe if I were a man and I had facial hair, if I had to gaze myself in the mirror, what would that shaving experience would be like? And I wrote about it. Um, um, when I was 11 years old, uh, when I was hospitalized um, for four months, I actually had chest hair. Um, I don't have that anymore, I'm sorry. Um, um, okay, um, I'm going to read a poem uh, call, and this one has such a long title. Um, it feels like longer than the poem itself. It is from my yellow heart. Um, I also had uh, open heart surgery about six weeks ago, so, um, OK, here we go. Infinity is a clock with dreams and with no forbearance and no leniency. And I, who knows the law of lamenting so well, move the ocean indoors and close the curtains. Of course, of course, they are Sith beings anchored by devastation and luminescence. OK, that's the title. Um, if you have open heart surgery, after you open heart surgery, I don't recommend writing long title poems. Um, just 
a life advice that you don't need. But um, um, each raindrop is a body of words clothed in distillation and synchronicity. You are synthetic and I am fabric, worn just yesterday before I am so desolate. So wanting your lettuce romaine over olive oil from the middle of the sea and east of your apex. Pinnacle of displeasure, you give me so much pleasure of diversion and I, who does not know better, confuse it for an inversion of shame. Take me to your house of words where your piano makes love to me by crushing me to the bottom of an office drawer. In the morning, you are sweeping tears into a dustpan. Okay. Um, I'm not going to read from Sheet Machine, but uh, I did the art cover for this. I had an art degree, and I made use of it. So here it is. Um, uh, the Potentinium. Oh, I'll read this. I'll read the back of this. Um, so um, I wrote this book because it was supposed to be really fat, like 300 pages. And I added it down to this much. <laughs> so I can be vicious with my editing. Um, but um, it was, I, I had the idea that this writer was going to type a whole manuscript Oh, this is the premise. This is not me pretending to be the writer. It's actually the premise of the story of the novel is that the writer was going to write this thick book uh, using the typewriter as by inserting the typewriter into her genital and using her pelvic muscle projected into a canvas, which is a sheet of paper uh, with typing it every single word of that novel. As you can imagine, that's a lot of muscle movement, uh, stomach uh, diaphragm mo movement, I assume. Um, and, um, but uh, the writer only made it to the first article of the novel, which is the, T-H-E. So that's all was typed. And so that's why it was edited so thin. But um, balance. I want to use your imagination to bestow your gifts. It's the only way I see that we can immortalize our love. Magnolia. Annihilation appeals to me more. Balance. Immortality is the perfect form of annihilation. It suffocates in its infinite distillation. Magnolia, your view, you view our love this way? Balance, yes, yes, yes. I'm so glad that book is that thin. Okay. Um, and I won't read from my novel because it's a novel. Um, it's too long. <laughs> and you're going to have to um, read it yourself. Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to try to read most of this, but I'm most likely not going to follow through with my words, so I'm going to read part of it. Um, and it's called Sexual Dar Dogs. Um, and so here it goes. I'll go as far as I can. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know my partner and I brought the son here from Iowa. So you are welcome um, that you're able to see sunlight. Um, and here we go to thank you for being here. And thank you for everyone that I failed to thank. Um, and here we go. Sexual dogs from my collection called A Brief Alphabet of Torture. She was a woman who had acquired great wealth through hard work, though the public believed her posterity came from her inheritance. 
She did not suffer from childhood abuse, and she was not one to endure emotional suffering due to negligence. In fact, as a child, she had been very well loved, maybe even over pampered, undoubtedly. She led a private life composed of disciplinary solitary rituals. After a long day at work facing the skyscraper, she returned to her mansion with its view of skyscrapers, of minimal decor and intelligence, to eat a large bowl of iceberg lettuce sprinkled heavily with fried bacon, prepared by her personal chef Anton, a translucent glass of fine gin with ice, and a bowl of avocado sprinkled with nutmeg and salt. Her meal was elegant and always the same. After her meal, she gave Anton a stern, cold gaze, which forced him to scurry off her mansion floor like an unwanted cricket. She had developed a lust for undefined, undefined solitude, one which over the year was hard to keep up. When they handcuffed her and led her down the long glass corridors of her mansion and down 100 floors via the elevator, the public and the pap paparazzi were quick to take snapshots. They were trying to capture the portrait of perversity. They discovered, quite to the contrary, that based on the angle of her chin and the sigh of her stride, she was elegant to a perverse degree, a sophisticated, erudite, aromatic, and so lovable that their cameras became shy and apologetic and even ashamed to stretch their necks out for another snapshot. When she was handcuffed, she was wearing a knee-high skirt, black high heels, and a white long-sleeved blouse with ruffles unfurling down her chest. And when the police officers tucked her into the police car, it was like she was a handkerchief folded into a box. They were careful with her. She had kept a personal sex service while she was single for many years. In fact, she had been single all her life. In the latter six years of her being before the incarceration, she became addicted to being licked. Though it wasn't an animal that she desired this from, she turned humans into dogs. Their sole job at her mansion was to become sexual dogs. She trained them carefully with a few pre-organized and preordained gestures of her hands to come and lick her. She underwent a thorough series of human acquisitions. She adopted and adhered to a clear code of hiring. Her rules were methodical and precise and almost random. She wanted women who were not too tall and did not talk too much, and men who were not too scrawny or short and were muscular and blonde but not too muscular. She did not prefer academic men, but desire erudite women so that when the woman licked her, they uttered educated moan that she could only be murmured by a scholar in the midst of her deposition or thesis defense. And most of all, she wanted her prostitute to be virgin prostitutes, meaning she was their first and probably only client. Over the years, she developed an organized, consistent group of 12 rotating prostitutes to work under her and for her. They had developed a syncopated schedule in which at least two men and two women were housed in the mansion at any given moment. And whenever she felt an unpremeditated flash of delirious desire to be licked, and with the push of one red button from her remote control, one that looked like a remote destinator, the services of these men and women would deliver her unexpected, expected, instantaneous and immediate high quality sex service with the tongues to her clit. They arrive in a hurry, always naked on all fours, panting social cognitively and growling to whenever she was located in a mansion, whether she was in her office writing emails to her subordinates or on her bed watching an episode of Mad Men or standing against her glass wall watching the sunset disappear into the mouth of the earth. She donned a silk rope. A prostitute came on all fours, bitingly and nippingly and slowly, and rather her underwear down her long legs as if she were sitting on her netted, swivel gray chair. And the prostitute would get on her knees and begin to dive slowly her tongue into her. 
She would lick the rims of her genital in one full circle before beginning another slow circle. She preferred virgin prostitutes because they often did not know what they were doing, and the untrained nature of their unjaded tongue gave her pleasure that she came to call authentic and natural. She had learned through trial and error that professional and veteran prostitutes knew too well what they were doing, and though she ultimately climaxed from their efficient work, she grew manically sad and unsatisfied. It took her six months to realize that the culprit of her lack of sexual interest was her lack of freshness in the, tongue, in the tongues among those she hired. Sometimes she would stand leaning into the glass frame of her mansion. If she wanted the pleasure to be muscular and texture of the tongue to be abrasive, a naked man remotely commanded would come on all fours to pleasure her. He would open her rope slowly and without much provocation. He would spread her legs and begin to lick her while her naked butt rested against the glass. Anyway, <laughs> I'm getting bored. But um, <laughs> um, I wrote this uh, in part because I did a lot of... Um, one of the reasons why I wrote this piece was um, I read an, es an, an essay written by like um, a fourth grader, I think. Um, it was uh, a miss, a typo. Um, um, they would talk, they were, the, 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 the prompt was that, uh, what was their favorite teacher? And they wrote, uh, the student wrote, um, he liked the teacher a lot, this particular teacher. And instead of writing liked, he said, he licked this teacher. And so that's how, one of the reasons how that story is just born is, but anyway, thank you everyone. Uh. Hi Jay. Hi V. Thank you so much. Yes. Awesome reading. Um, I will you so V asked me. Um, so the Low Residency Creative Writing Program is four years old and maybe we've had nine residencies and V has been uh, five, four or five of them, a lot of them um, on Zoom, of course. Um, and V asked me if, you know, we were talking about like, oh, well, maybe I've read, I don't know if I've read this before at PNCA and there's just been so many readings. Um, and in that moment, I'm like, yeah, I can't, I can't remember any of our readings, actually. Um, none of them were coming to mind. But then you mentioned this book and the very sexy 10-page poem that is in this book you did read at oh. one of our readings, and it was incredible. So I do recommend this book. Um, so I have two questions for you, and then we will take questions from the audience. So that gives you all some time to think about the questions while we, we handle these two questions. Um, and <coughs> V and I, and now it's V and Jess and I, um, talk a lot about tennis, um, but we will try not to talk about tennis tonight, but maybe we will, I don't know. Um, so my question, my first question, one of my favorite parts about your practice is all of the collaborative work that you do. Um, and I highly recommend you all go to V's website um, and hit this section, I think it's just interviews, and it's one of the most amazing trove of extended conversations that V, that you've done with other writers. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that experience, um, why you really seek to have conversations with other writers, um, and maybe what it has, what you think it, how it informs your practice. Um. Well, um, earlier in my writing career, um, there was this poet who um, found me on Instagram and started texting me. And I was wondering why she was texting me. And 
Um, I finally discovered that she didn't, she wanted more publicity for her work, but she didn't have any interviews or any reviews on her book. So I told her, just send your book over and I'll, I'll, I'll interview you. And so um, I, I read her book and then we, over a text, we just, I just asked her a bunch of questions and I start transcribing um, my, um, my questions and her answer into a document and then we found a place that published it. And I realized that a lot of poets um, and writers are especially women and um, color folks um, do not uh, get the kind of publicity that they uh, deserve and need for especially if there is their first book and so or the second um, and so I took out some time and and just reach out to writers that I thought didn't get any reviews or any interviews or wanted to be interview and I started reading all their work and and start to ask really weird questions um, some of my questions are obviously like one of the questions is like, would you would you love someone? Would you cross a river for someone who whom you don't love? Um, but I think it's um, so. I asked really weird questions, and that started the journey. And um, and then people start sending my, me their books and wanted to be interviewed. So it became sort of organic and. And then um, publicists, publicists just reach out and just send me books, even though I didn't ask for it. And they just, they just send me books. And I would just like, if I was staring at the ceiling one day, and I'm like, OK, I'll interview this person. Um, and that's how <laughs> um, I think I interview over 100. Uh, um, I do a deep dive of reading, so I try my best to read all their work before interviewing them. And I usually read all their interviews before interviewing them, so I don't ask them the same questions. Like, um, um, but I've been lazy. Um, I have now a third question that just occurred to me. Um, would, you, would you cross a river for somebody that you don't love? Yeah, I would. Um, good, got that done. <laughs> um, third question, um, before we tur turn it over. Um, you work not only in all of these different genres and you're doing collaborative writing projects um, and the interviews, but you also work off the page and you, you do visual art and drawing, and you just were showing me your amazing watercolor and prints. Um, I'm wondering how, um, what, if, and if you can't answer this, by the way, no, no problem, but if you have a sense of, with any given day, what might be sending you or, or guiding you to one genre over another genre, or to, you know, or, or if there's a more process around it? Um. Um, it's often time project-based. So during COVID, I collaborated with a lot of writers, um, poets, and um, various folks who are around the world. We had a lot of time, a lot of downtime to create. So um, I would carve out, like, two days out, I mean two hours out of the day just to meet someone over a, a dock and start writing a manuscript together. And so that would become my project and that determined, so if we're doing that every single day, it sort of gave me like uh, permission to create whatever that we're creating. Um, sometimes it's a short story uh, and sometimes it's a poem and sometimes it's just a very long hybrid book and it just depends on who am I collaborating with. In terms of my own projects, um, um, I think lately my pain dictates how I create. I don't create as much. I'm in a lot of pain. Um, after my open heart surgery, just 
picking up a pen or a paper or even thinking about reading or writing, just um, the pain gets in the way. And so um, I really can't concentrate. I usually can overcome my pain by doing art, but now it's become the reverse where just the pain just gets in the way. And um, um, I'm better at, I, I mean, as a result of that, I'm, I'm better at writing thank you notes <laughs> as a way of being creative, I guess. Um, 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 I really like writing thank you cards to people. Like, I think it helps me because then it helps me cope with my pain because if I can appreciate someone doing something so wonderful for the world, it gives me kind of hope that um, things aren't so bad if I'm appreciative of just even someone's small gestures. So I think it's like the ritual of just like sitting down with a pen and finding small things that people are doing that are so incredible. Um, it's an artistic outlet for me now. Um, um, and also I don't like saying thank you in one way. I like a million different ways to say thank you. So it forces me to be creative about um, articulating my gratitude. So they don't sound, all my letters don't sound thank you for this. <laughs> um, um, and so that's that's really exciting for me right now is, is the ritual of thanking. Um, but in general, um, um, sometimes I make art to cope with pain. Uh, sometimes it just helps me uh, be distracted from my pain. Um, I like playing poker with my siblings a lot. Um, that helps with pain. Um, but um, um, I, I don't have any, like, I have prodigious projects in mind, but I don't have the physical um, energy to do so. So they're kind of in the back burner right now while I heal. And I don't know how long it will take me to heal. Um, the last time I had open heart surgery, it took me three and a half years to heal, and I never heal from it. Um, and I, it required the second open heart surgery for me to heal, so I'm in the second phrase of healing, and maybe this one will work out, maybe it won't, but um, um, it's too soon to find out, to know, I think, so um, it's okay to not make art, you know, uh, it took me a long time to realize that too, like, because I'm so prolific, I feel like I'm always needing to do something. And I realized that if I don't create anymore and I just become um, um, a lump of blood and skin, um, it's okay too. I like the idea of being a rock where the river of life kind of wash you over and sort of like trizzle you down, like flatten you down to you are nothing. And I like the idea of that as well. The thank you for those answers. Um, so <clears throat> I'd like to say that I would also cross a river for somebody I don't love. Um, and now we're gonna take um, questions from the audience. And I think we should also give, for anyone who has a question, give them the chance to answer that question. If you want, you don't have to. Um, you can pass, of course. Um, but yeah, so if anyone has a question, um, I will walk around with the microphone. Or if you're more comfortable just asking it, and then I'll repeat it for our stream. It's up to you. Noah, do you want the microphone? Awesome. Hello, thank you for the reading. My question 
is is there any poems in your archive that you've returned back to to like read over and over again or have you written and then you're on to the next thought um if someone mentioned about and i need to review it for an interview or for references i would need to because i have amnesia about my own work. Um, I've written so many of them. This is, um, I have like, um, I think only about one third of what you see is out in the world, and the other two thirds are still waiting to find homes to be published. So um, I, I do forget my own work, and I don't have a great deal of attachment to most of my poems. Um, uh, some of them are really bad, um, and some of them are not too bad. Um, but I, I do forget sometime. And then sometime I would notice it, re reading it somewhere out of context, and I realize, like, oh, I like this poem, and then I realize I wrote it. Um, uh, <laughs> that's, the fun, that's the funny part. Uh, it's like realizing that you forget your own poem um, and your own work. And my short stories, I, that happens a lot. I would have to read the whole short story, um, especially when other people are interviewing me. And they like, we're going to interview you in this particular short story. I, 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 I oftentimes go back and review it just because I want to prepare for my own um, reference as well. And then I will remember, like, oh, this is why I wrote it. This is the reason behind it. And it's like, I think it, it allows me to get to know myself um, in a way that I wouldn't have known if I had not had amnesia of myself. So that distance helps a lot. Thank you for your question. Did you want to answer your own question? Yeah. Um, uh, I don't think I would cross a river for someone, like a stranger, I wouldn't. Uh, I guess it, there has to be like some level of familiarity or love or something. Thank you, Noah. Hi, thank you so much for your readings. Um, such a pleasure to hear you read. Uh, I was wondering about your your collaborations. Um, are those typically like, I was just curious about how those come about for you and the other people you're writing with, um, if it's similar to the interview situation or are these people that you're very close with typically? Um. So I have about 10 books of collaboration. I think three of them are out in the world, and the fourth one is coming in October. And of those collaborations, I think half of them are with people I really love, like I'm really close to, like my best friend or my partner or really close friends. And half of it is with strangers. Um, there was this woman who was on, who was a PhD student, who wanted to ask me out on a date, and and she was in Baltimore, and I said, why is this Baltimore person asking me out on a date when I'm in Vegas? And I said, um, and so I said, well, we can't go on a date, but you want to write a play together, <laughs> and. She was doing her PhD, and she was bored with her PhD dissertation, maybe, and wanted an outlet, so she said yes. So we sat down, we finished it, even though she was a terrible date. Um, I don't recommend dating her. Um, um, the second collaboration is with a woman who is, I got addicted to playing Scrabble during COVID. Um, I play Scrabble for 16 hours a day, and I said, 
I can't be doing this for 16 hours a day. So I got on Scrabble, and the person who, I, my opponent who was playing Scrabble was terrible because she's Norwegian. And, and so um, I said, um, she wanted to write a short story collection together. And her English was like broken English, and I don't speak any Norwegian. So I started learning Norwegian to write um, a, po a, a, a poetry collection with her and also a short story collection with her. And so I started learn, and she taught me all of these wonderful phrases in Norwegian. I don't know how to pronounce in Norwegian, but I know the um, when I see them on like um, a sentence level. And, and she had four kids and a husband, and two of them were autistic. And so the only time that she could collaborate was 3 p.m. Iowa time. So every 3 p.m. I get online and with a Google uh, translator and my imagination, I sat down and wrote in Norwegian with her. Um, and so that was from a complete stranger whom I've never met. And we don't have any romantic interest, just the pure fact that we love, um, uh, we love writing stories together. And I realized that she's, she's a visual artist and a carpenter. And um, so her writing, her degree isn't in writing at all. Her expertise isn't in writing at all. But she is one of the best writers that I've interacted with because I realized that do you need to like have pre-training to become a writer? You can be an artist and then immediately become the most brilliant writer. Um, I think it's just the amount of heart she put into it. Um, and um, the way she just writes sentences, which was the opposite of me. Um, and because we alternate sentences, so she write one line and write, I write the next line, and we alternate. So my abstract um, experimental form blend well with her traditional phrasing. So the story comes together really nicely. So we have this excellent chemistry on the page. And it wouldn't have been possible if, um, if I wasn't addicted to Scrabble. <laughs> Um, so, um, and there were other writers who I interview, and during the interview process, we had so much chemistry on the page, um, and I said, why can't we collaborate on a book? So, I'm writing uh, three, uh, a, a thousand page manuscript with her. We are about one third done. It's taken us over two years. <laughs> um, and we're still at it. Um, it's just going to take us a while to write the next 600 pages or so. Um, but the first manuscript is coming out in October, and it's called Mechanophilia, which is love for machine. Um, so and let me see what other collaborations. There's a few others in there that I've forgotten. but. And that's another thing I forget. I have manuscripts. <laughs> so whenever, um, if I dig deep, I'll be able to find some of the other manuscripts that I collaborated with others. But I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. It's such a joy to like hear your stories. You, they just like come out naturally. <laughs> um, and to answer your question, I, I guess I would need more context on where we are, who that person is on the other side of the river. But my inclination, if I have no context, I would say I probably wouldn't cross a river. Some of you that said no is no. very practical. <laughs> yeah. Jackson. Hi there. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your readings. Um, that was incredible. Um, I'm just curious, like, um, what other types of media uh, do you enjoy listening to or watching or reading? Um, yeah, just for leisure or maybe for research or both? Media, you say? 
Yeah. Like films or? Yeah, like movies or maybe novels or something like that. Um, I like watching um, bank robberies films, um, heist films a lot. Um, I just like problem solvings in films. So bank robberies is like you put yourself in a very difficult position and now how you get out of it. And, um, and I think a lot of storytelling, a lot of poetry making, a lot of creative acts um, demand that kind of um, uh, solution. And I feel like every time I make art, I'm robbing a bank. Um, I mean, not literally, but mm, you get that sense, metaphorically. Um, and so, um, you know, like you, you, you put all these lines together in a poem, and now you have to figure out how they worked well together and how um, you can um, seduce the reader into it, you know? Not just the reader that is um, um, an audience, but the reader that's yourself. And so that when you return it, or if you can uh, step into the river of yourself twice, um, what would that be? You know, I think a lot about that. Uh, so, um, and so I watch a lot of heist films and like Cole Han Luke, even if it's like a um, classic. Um, I turn to those for inspirations. Um, I'm by nature addicted to Scrabble. So <laughs> um, I had to, um, when I was young, I, because I play so much of it, um, I asked my sister who specialized in computer if she can lock me out, block me from accessing Scrabble websites. So, um, and she did it for me, and that's how I became a writer. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I think I would cross a river for probably just about anybody. I think so. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so when you're writing collaborations with people, when you're working on a manuscript, do you ever feel tempted to forge like a singular voice? Does it ever feel like like a melding or like an integration, or is the project one of like two two differentiated voices talking? Like, is there does it also is it context dependent? Um, for like um, long projects that I end up working with a collaborator across time, our voice kind of bend together. It just by default, it just naturally, you just naturally syncopate with someone's voice. Um, it, you can't help it. It just, that's just the nature of the mirroring effect of, and it's done on a, a subconscious level. You didn't even notice, and, but um, some of my collaborators, we start dreaming the same thing. We start having like f um, uh, 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 finishing each other's sentences. We kind of sort of figure out what the next person's line would be like. And so when you get to know someone a long time, those natural um, bending of the will um, and the form, they assimilate very well and they, they they, they are not done by force. I wouldn't force it. I don't recommend forcing it. Um, so if someone has a very distinct voice from from another, I just let it be on the page, and let that person have their own voice in this collaboration. Um, I don't think forcing is the way to go, um, um, and letting the natural discourse of the intimacy of just creating something together. Um, to unfold in its natural way is is the best way to honor the the, the collaboration. Um, I do um, I do not like collaborators who are flakers, mm. so I don't really engage with flakers. So they have a very small window in which I collaborate with them, and I I would just terminate that collaboration 
if I recognize that there's a flaker nest in them. So I have a high flaker detection. <laughs> um, and so um, um, I don't know how useful that skill set is, but um, if they flake, likely we won't have a relationship, a, a, a collaborative relationship together. And it goes without saying, I just don't have tolerance for that. Um, because it's psychological energy that's wasted, and I'd rather save that for a project with another person or with myself. Can I ask a little follow-up? Yes. Uh, do you feel changed by each collaboration? Very much. It's probably the best experiences. It's better than writing by yourself. I think it's significantly better than writing by yourself. I, Of all the great work that I've put together that I thought was great, it's not comparison to the ones that I've done with another person. It's significantly superior work. Um, the work that I collaborate with another person is just a lot better. Um, I feel like I'm not, I'm changing as a writer, that I'm not stagnant. Uh, a part of that is transformation, um, the willingness to just like um, not uh, be uh, recalcitrant, recalcitrant or rebellious within one's way of existence, that there is a, it feels like a bamboo effect where it's just very bent but it won't break. And I love that very much. I, I prefer collaboration over, like if I have to sit down and write my own work, I always choose the collaboration over my own. Um, um, there are people who like, they must like carve out time for themselves. And I think the best time to spend time with yourself is with another person. Um, I, I, I've just, I love the solitude of being next to someone and having my own cosmo, my own um, galaxy. Um, like people think like they need to be like, be alone and isolate in some corner to have their own independence and galaxy and, I, and cosmos. And I feel like that is um, 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 a misguided outlook. I think it's uh, asserting um, very artificial boundaries on existence. Um, you can be sitting next to someone and be a thousand miles away from them, or you can be um, a thousand miles within them, within yourself, and still be worlds apart. So, um, having written so many manuscripts by myself alone, and having written 10 manuscripts with another person, and collaborating in either film, or drawing, or art, or any the interdisciplinary arts, I, I completely pro collaboration. I, I always advocate it, and I always recommend it, and I always open that door for future collaborations. I teach collaborative work between peers. Um, I highly encourage it, because um, I think life by nature and existence by nature is solitary. Uh, one doesn't even need to extend that vocabulary than necessary. So I don't believe, because I've been in pain for a lot of part of my life. Um, and I think a solitary existence is a very painful existence. And, uh, and if one can't, can help it, don't go there, you know? Um, don't lock yourself in, don't lock the door into yourself from yourself or something like that. Um, th I think it's a, a, a manuscript with that title, which I'm butchering up pretty bad, but... Um, but would you cross a river for someone you don't love? For you. <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait to be on the other side of the mountain. So we have one more question, last okay. question. Oh, before um, we have our last question, I just want to encourage you all. We have stickers here available. If you would like to take a sticker, we don't have books for sale, but you can go to your favorite online bookshop, like bookshop.org or powells.com, and you can get all of these books. But tonight, 
right now, you can get these amazing stickers of the covers of these books. So, last question. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. My name is Elena. Um, I'm just curious to know um, the differences in inspiration for like poetry versus prose. I write fiction and I cannot write poetry. Um, and I'm just interested to know like how different textures and experiences and artifacts like the boy's letter uh, call to different mediums in writing. Um, that, uh, I mean, your concern and your question is very um, pertinent, um, especially if you're uh, earlier in your writing career. And I can answer this question by telling you about an experience that I had when I was applying for um, a Brown University. So Brown is known for the experimental program. And so I wanted to go to Brown very much. Um, and so I apply in both poetry and fiction. And I didn't know how it worked. So basically, I took my short story and I gave line breaks to them. And so it became a poem, and I submitted that for my poetry submission at Brown. And then I took my, my, um, my, uh, my, sh my, um, uh, my short, uh, um, uh, my short stories, <laughs> and I gave line breaks to them, and I submitted for the other. And so I got accepted into both program in both poetry and fiction. And um, I think the only thing that distinguished one form from the other is line breaks. So if you want to turn one of your short story into a poem, just give line breaks and then and take a few words here and there out, you know, randomly, just for the fun of it. <laughs> um, just to confuse the reader a little, you know? Like, oh, why did you do this? This is so brilliant, you know? Um, but, um, that's the only clear distinction. Um, in terms of texture, you can generate texture by like superimposing them. Like right now, visual poetry is really popular, um, at least what I'm doing right now. And um, and you can do that with layering, just like going to a, like um, a Google Doc and you just layer the text and then print it over it, and that can become poem. Your short story can easily become poems if you just like don't do too much with it, um, um, and you just experiment with texture. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, things making sense, especially in a short story. And um, people say because my work is so experimental, it seems like it's um, nonsensical. But I really plot out my short stories. I just don't know how plotted it. It's just really plotted. Um, and um, I don't always uh, show the coding for how that is being plotted. But once it's shown, it's very visible that it's plotted. Um, but because experimental writing is difficult for people to read, they assume that it doesn't make sense. And so sometimes you have to take time to distinguish the two. And, and that would just take time for you to practice. Uh, you just need to make the time to write. And um, and I wouldn't worry about like if one poem or um, um, if a poem is written, if it's, it looks like a poem or if a short story looks like a, a poem. Um, if someone asks for a poem, I just give them a short story and they just love it. <laughs> uh, but whenever I give them a good short story, they don't accept it. <laughs> so it's confusing, you know? <laughs> like I'm like, this is a really good story, and but they won't accept it. But I gave them a poem. And I said, this is a short story, and I just love it. <laughs> it's very confusing to me, so um, I wouldn't worry about it. Unless it's, you need to get work published, then I would. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and would you? I would. OK. V, thank you so much. Let's okay. give Vicky now a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, and thank you all for coming tonight. April 26th is our last lecture. Thank you.